Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, it is a pleasure to give a talk on uh, something what uh, actually looks like recent developments in language technologies, but don't expect uh, some spectacular new findings. But rather, uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, sort of uh, activity and uh, I would say uh, two years of uh, effort to bring the language technologies out and to, to somehow show how they can be used by uh, other research communities. And in this respect I will immediately show you the overview of my talk. For those, for those of you who are not completely familiar with language technologies, I will give a short introduction in a nutshell. And then I'll uh, say something more about Metanet and uh, Metasherp in particular. And I will uh, end up with some uh, nice uh, examples of language technologies that we use at uh, X-Like Project. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so why language technologies? Well, the reasons are actually quite simple, because they are already here, all around us. We are soaked in language technologies, although we don't even know sometimes. Well, using spelling checker in any word processor is language technologies. And voice control in your smartphones is, of course, the same thing. Or search and translation with uh, Google is the same thing. Or uh, speed generation in computer games, maybe not your generation. Well, but yes, yes, maybe your generation as well. And uh, computer assisted language learning and um, OCR uh, correction part of OCR or document classification. Or if you want to talk to your Mercedes, of course, you will use language technologies. Voice control it. And then you can even select whether you want a female or male voice to, to talk to. And uh, <coughs> of course, uh, in the States, if you call any call centers, you will hardly find people from the other side of the, of the telephone line. So it's, it's usually some kind of dialogue system. Okay? And this is only the beginning, actually. And um, the reason for that is that um, language technologies could be considered today in IT as one of the basic technologies like network or database or web technologies are considered already. And, uh, but it's, of course, uh, more complex because of the uh, uh, complexity of the natural language, not just at the level of words, but also phrases and sentences and clauses. And even more, you can have uh, different varieties of language. So you can have a formal and informal language, you can have specialized languages, control languages, and so on. And then you can multiply all that with the number of languages in the world, which is roughly estimated between six and 7,000. Okay, not all of them are, uh, have uh, literacy, not all of them have a digital literacy, but still you have several hundred languages which tend to be digitally literate. At least you can look at the number of languages for which Wikipedias are being produced, and that, that's roughly an estimation what uh, number of uh, languages we are talking about. But of course, language technologies will help us to overcome the communication barriers, not just between humans and the knowledge, which is somewhere stored, but also humans and technology and machines, and of course humans and humans using different languages. And, uh, <coughs> and in, at the very same time, and I would say that means in the previous year or two, language technologies have reached some of the old goals, I would say. Well, machine translation is popping out. Different systems of, for machine translation has become extremely popular with introduction of statistical machine translation in the last 10 years, let's say. Uh, when I say when they're like mushrooms all around, that means that you have commercial companies uh, uh, trying to live and earn money on machine translation, providing the machine translation output. And then, of course, you have seen uh, IBM Watson winning the, the Jeopardy um, contest against two uh, uh, human champions, so the, this is one of the old dreams coming true, not just to beat the world championship, human world championship in chess, which happened, what, 15 years ago, something like that, but there you have it, a uh, completely different area of knowledge and, uh, and um, expertise. And then, of course, you have iPhones with a Siri Assistant, which is still in infancy, but al already very useful for the people who who want to communicate with their uh, smartphones in this way. And, uh, 
but the demand for language te technologies is growing really fast and uh, there are several factors that, uh, that influence this demand and one of the factors is of course um, EU. We, well you are involved in EU almost 10 years we will be, in, well, when I say be, I mean uh, Croatia will be involved in, in, in you in several months, and then we'll see how we'll survive all, all together that thing. Okay, <coughs> but uh, European Union has the legal obligations uh, uh, based on the egalitarian uh, inclusive approach to all languages, and that's one of the demands for language technologies. And of course, EU market or markets are multilingual. Um, our export markets are multilingual and the European institutions also are asking for uh, language technologies and when I talk about multilingual technologies here that means first thing what will come to your mind is of course machine translation but that's not all it's also cross-lingual querying, um, querying through databases, uh, knowledge extraction from uh, different types of texts and so on and so on. But <clears throat> having in mind uh, the complexity of language and applications that is needed to, to process the language, unfortunately we, we may still say that research in this area is too scarce and underfunded. And um, we might say that language technology research community is suffering from a lack of interoperability, standards, and, and, and some kind of coordination. And even more, <coughs> we still need more language data. And uh, when we say that there's no, not enough research in language technologies, uh, we may say that it's only with English that situation is somehow acceptable. But for other languages, all other languages are badly covered. Even the big languages like German, I would say. And um, <coughs> what is striking is the lack of some basic technologies for, for smaller languages, which is, you would say, politically incorrect way to, to, to call them. The politically correct way in Eurospeak would be under-resourced languages. But it's, in fact, it's the fact that these are the languages with the smaller number of speakers. I mean, like Slovenian, Latvian, Lithuanian, or Estonian, or Croatian, or Finnish, or Dan Danish, or, or um, something like that. Okay, so these are roughly several million speakers countries. And uh, of course, you have a problem of um, market there. So the market is not big enough that companies will have enough interest to invest into research into language technologies in that, in that language, like in Germany it would. But in Latvian, you would have to find a state or at least linguistic community that will have interest to invest into development of language technologies. And you might say that you actually need the same amount of person months to develop language technologies for German as for Latvian. Because uh, you can look what your neighbors are doing, you can spy on them. But then uh, it's useless to use a German dictionary to build a Latvian parser or something like that. It simply doesn't work. Okay? You have to do it on your own. <coughs> so, this is, so, so this lack of coordination and interoperability and lack of, of uh, basic uh, resources for some languages uh, led the co LT community to the idea of building a common approach to, to try to concentrate and make a pan-European effort and this one is called Metanet and that means that we uh, the idea was to to build up appropriate program to ask for appropriate funding support and to address appropriate actors in this in this community that means research community as well as commercial possible or business oriented uh, applications. So <clears throat> that was the starting point of the whole Meta vision and uh, Metanet was uh, then um, um, considered to be a network of excellence which is trying to to build a technological fund foundations for European multilingual society and that means that <clears throat> not just with Metanet which is a network of excellence we, which is a stable EC con instrument. But there has been also association which is called META, actually, actually in a strategic alliance that is trying to connect all possible stakeholders in 
that are dealing with language technologies. And in this respect, uh, the AI community is one of these communities that might find interest in using language technologies. In fact, in one of the uh, first definitions of AI, I mean, using a natural language is an integral part of it, isn't it? And <clears throat> so the idea is, of, of course, to uh, approach to these open problems with other, in collaboration with other fields or communities. So these are so-called three layers. So we wanted to build a community, build a MetaShare, which is an open resource exchange platform, and later I will say something about it, and of course build bridges to the neighboring uh, communities. So uh, this is the web address where you can find something about network. At this moment, <coughs> so officially, the, the funding is uh, completed. So the, the official the project ended in 31st of January this year. And, but the network of excellence at this moment uh, is uh, composed of 60 research centers from 34 countries. And um, actually, it started as a FP7 project T4Me, where a Slovenian partner, this institute was on one of the funding uh, partners. And then later, it was coordinate, in a coordinated way supported by three additional ICT PSP projects covering other languages. Okay, <coughs> sorry. And um, in the very same time, during the building of this network of excellence, a Meta Alliance is, has grown up to more than 700 members from 60 countries, even overseas countries, of course. The idea was to have a vision process in a discussion in vision and a discussion within the vision groups. One of the outcomes is a so-called series of language white papers on individual European languages. So 31 volume has been published at um, Springer. Uh, and um, the whole the whole network of excellence ended up in something what is called strategic research agenda that is addressing the situation about language technologies in Europe in 2020. So we have some kind of projection. And of course, uh, inclusion of uh, other language communities into language policy bodies and inclusion of professional uh, associations. <coughs> so the results roughly could be could be uh, described in this way. One of the major results is uh, this language white paper series where using the same methodology um, the research groups from each of these countries actually provided information about the status of language technology, of the development of the language technology for that language community. And this allowed, so this uh, same methodology allowed us to make a comparison between the different uh, language communities and uh, language technologies. And of course this made us uh, uh, available to detect the gaps uh, that exist in language technologies for a particular language. For instance, you have a very good speech processing in Hungarian, but it doesn't, it's, it's, it's not so good in Slovak. And um, that's, of course, a Slovenian volume about, uh, that, that has been published there. But um, <coughs> the next, I would say, major achievement of the whole network of excellence is a strategic research agenda, which is a strategy that uh, has been developed and how to include the language technology in uh, Horizon 2020 that is being produced at this moment, which is actually FP8. And of course, you can freely download uh, the strategic uh, research agenda and uh, any uh, white paper on any language from uh, the following addresses. So <coughs> the idea was, of course, try to, to see how in, in this uh, triangle of uh, of uh, activities that are either, if we are talking about socially aware interactive assistance or some kind of social intelligence or some kind of translation facilities like translation cloud, how these three points in the triangle could be connected and what kind of language technologies we need for that. And then we of course see that we need language resources for knowledge information technology. We need language resources specifically tailored for multimedia information technologies and we need them for translation technologies. But in the middle you have basic resources for language technologies which are really basic. It, that means you need corpora, 
you need digital lexicons and so on and so on. And not just that, they have to be more and more organized, not just uh, a bunch of a digital text put together. Okay, and this, of course, that uh, <coughs> idea, that very notion uh, was then uh, materialized in, uh, in a form of meta-share, which actually has a rationale behind it in this, in, that could be put in this form. So in many other sciences, sharing data actually opened, opened uh, research and de development in this area. And uh, support innovative applications. What does it mean? That means that I would say the age of, uh, of researchers collect, that, has, that have collected the information, the collected the data and then store them on their hard disk or tapes or wherever, um, jealously uh, keeping that from anyone else actually is gone. It's passed by. So the whole idea, uh, if you look at the, this, for instance, information, this one is striking. So the Human Genome Project uh, made their uh, results accessible, freely accessible. And this generated 3 billion euros of research and development investment. So this data set alone. Okay? And then it generated half a billion euros in economic activity. So there is also, there is significant potential if you share the data, right? And you have quotes like this at this time. Hmm? Uh, so how does this reflect to, to, to language and language technologies? Uh, one of the, of course, most co complex uh, cognitive faculties that we face. Uh, that means that uh, <coughs> You have questions and, and uh, requests in different uh, LT4A, uh, like everyone is looking for English language X parallel corpus, because everyone needs that type of data, for instance. And they also uh, would like to know whether these uh, parallel corpora are aligned, so sentence for sentence, for sentence, and whether, for instance, there are tools for language identification in Twitter streams, because analyzing Twitter streams today is extremely popular or um, Facebook post, posts or any other kind of uh, social media. And then, of course, uh, you, uh, there are, there's a huge request for basic text analysis tools like similarity measures and, and this type of tools that will give you um, from the top view whether two documents or two collections of documents look alike or similar, to what respect, to which extent, and so on, so on. Okay, so... <coughs> So the rationale behind the meta-share is uh, that only portion of language resources uh, is known to, uh, is announced, is shared, is, is uh, traded. Okay? Despite the very fact that uh, collecting data, cleaning, annotation and, and maintenance is extremely costly business. Has any one of you tried to build a large corpus? Probably yes or not, some of you yes, I'm sure, and uh, uh, sometimes it takes a long time to, to build it, a long of uh, human uh, effort. Sometimes it's uh, maybe automatically derived from web today, but then you need a human effort to make it useful. So you still need to invest a lot of human effort inside. And yet all that is kept aside, kept someone in, in, in in obscurity of someone's hard disk and then not being shared, okay? So, <clears throat> but the idea behind this meta-share was that if we want to really make a real progress in, in this field is that we need to take care about all those aspects which are the scientific, technical, legal, uh, organizational. That will enable us to recycle, to reuse, to repurpose the already existing data, okay? So, in this respect, MetaShare has its, that's the core idea. Uh, so the MetaShare could be defined or is actually a platform or that tries to match the language resource provider. So the ones who are, who are doing, who are producing language resources and tools and the consumers. Okay, so we are like a, like a dating agency actually. We are trying to find the best match. Okay, so how, how can you do that? 
if you if you go to a dating agency of course you will look at their database and see what they offer and then you will probably try to match uh, the person by your own preferences okay you will not probably ask about his or hers okay but for language data what metashare is providing is not just providing uh, the the contact point but also uh, uh, enables uh, that your data will be visible uh, forces you to document your data so that it's not just left somewhere undocumented and forces you to make to have a unique id so in this in this community you will finally have a unique ID where, with, with which you can reference your data and of course uh, allow you to have it available and preserve it somewhere because the whole system is running somewhere in data repositories and you, if you're a data provider you can simply provide your, that, your data to a, to a repository you don't care about it, you don't do the backup, you don't take it, you, you don't care about 24-7 uptime and so on and so on so you simply uh, leave that to, to the professionals, I would say. So what was the expectation that the wide availability and openness and sharing of language resources and tools will contribute to boost uh, research, technology and innovation, of course. And uh, this is the web address where, where you can see um, what is available. This is a, a rough architecture. So you see that you have different inventories, language repositories. They're all connected as a federation through the same metadata model. And then you have a meta share inventory which is so-called um, managing nodes. And from the user side, which is from this side, then you have a registration uh, and the similar protocols for users. And then the users can search, browse, license, download and so on and so on. And, of course, uh, external repositories can also access that. You can join MetaShare as either core user support providers or repository service providers or depositing only or associating or third party. So there are a number of layers at which you can join to MetaShare. Okay, so what is MetaShare today? So a network of 23 language repositories in 19 European and candidate countries. You, at this moment, it's more than 2,100 language resources and tools available through this network. And uh, the very uh, software that is running behind the MetaShare platform is also open source. So you can do with it whatever you want. You can download it, you can set up your own language resource repository, and you can link it to the whole, to the whole uh, MetaShare. Uh, and of course, <coughs> sorry, there are also legal instruments so that means the licensing mechanisms that allow you to use the data in a way that is appropriate to your needs. And of course, uh, you have uh, support like help desk and user forum and similar things. But <coughs> uh, uh, MetaShare is also sharing the mapping services to big resource in inventories, uh, so research infrastructures like Clarine, Eric, or OLAC or similar things. And um, <coughs> MetaShare has been launched in Berlin in uh, 25th of January this year. You see here the, the responsible persons who were all trying to push the same button at once, which, is, which was a, a, a feat by its own. Okay. So uh, <coughs> about MetaShare, I will say only a few words now from the user side. I'll not tell you anything about provider side because you, you will, I, I assume that you will be uh, mostly interested uh, to, into it uh, as users. So you can search through central inventory, you can browse <coughs> using multiple facets of filters. And uh, of course you can access the re um, resources checking the, the, license, the licenses that are connected to these resources and get support from uh, help desks and of course consult the knowledge base. So Meta Share looks like that when you open it and then of course you can search for Slovenian which is I would say quite appropriate and then you will get 17 language resources. Um, most of them here as you see are multilingual so, and then you can you can have either uh, them downloaded or you can have them 
used in, and then included in some other tools. And uh, <coughs> of course, but uh, in MetaShare you can find some uh, types of resources that are directly, I would say, of a direct interest to AI researchers, either for training or uh, deriving any kind of statistics or pattern matching uh, um, procedures. For instance, you have 58 word nets available there. So you have ontologically based uh, resource. Or uh, parsers, syntactic parsers, there are 42 different ones. Or uh, ontology annotation and building tools like this one. Or you can find already made, downloadable and useful ontologies like uh, GeoNet Portugal, for instance. You have the whole geospatial ontology of the state of the Portugal, where that means that you can go from the top level of a state, then you have it uh, uh, analyzed on, uh, on uh, different regions, I think you the regions, and then you have towns, you have streets, you, you <coughs> go up to the level of street number. So, it's, uh, so you immediately know, if you get, pick up the name of a street, you immediately know to which uh, town or region or part of Portugal belongs to. Okay? So you have such already predefined ontologies freely available, downloadable, like hotel ontology. So ontology about accommodation. So if you go to a hotel, what kind of concepts you have there? Hmm? So the ones who are dealing with the uh, scenes, and the scenarios, I mean, these things could be extremely useful, I would say. And for instance, you have multilingual adaptation of existing ontologies like Polish lexicon for open psych. You, you didn't know that, yes, for instance. Or you have, a <coughs> for instance, the whole Genia uh, event corpus with medical events described and annotated in text so that you can, for instance, see which are the lexical groundings for some events hmm, in the med in, uh, medical area. Okay, so these are roughly, um, this is roughly all what I wanted to show you about MetaNet and MetaShare. So I'm, I'm simply inviting you to go there and browse yourself and check out what, whether you can find something which is useful to you, either directly or derived in a certain way, out of this 2,000 and more, 2,000 plus language resources. And now I'd like to Con conclude my talk with some examples from uh, language technology usage in X-like project. Just quickly about the X-like project, it's FP7, it uh, belongs to this area, total cost is that, duration is this one, it's a strap type project, uh, coordinator is Marco Grobelnik from this institute, and the website of course you can consult is that one. Uh, the the partners in the project are full partners uh, listed here <coughs> and uh, there are associated partners of course uh, like IIT in Mumbai or New York Times and there are more to come because uh, it looks like the X-like project has uh, uh, attracted some attention by some, some um, uh, news agencies so they all want to pop in. That's very interesting and very promising I would say. And the main goal could be formulated in this way that X-like is trying to monitor and aggregate knowledge that is somehow spread through, through general or mainstream social me and social media and to enable um, publishers or information brokers, uh, as they call them, to <coughs> try to monitor this media and extract uh, knowledge and events when they appear. And of course they can use it for business intelligence, for whatever, uh, whatever means. I mean, what information brokers are doing, they're selling information. So the whole idea is to, to find the information in the most uh, straightforward way. And um, of course the, the, the project is trying to combine the capabilities uh, from several areas, there's a computational linguistics, machine learning, text mining, semantic technologies and so on. And the idea is to, in order to enable this cross-lingual text understanding by machines. So I would say text understanding is a little bit far-fetched. I wouldn't call it that way. I would simply say, okay, some kind of knowledge extraction. I wouldn't say it because understanding, we can now go into very deep philosophical debates about understanding. And I'm sure you went through that. 
I wouldn't like to repeat it, and I'm, I'm, I think that uh, maybe it's not even time or place to, for you to, to start it again. <coughs> no, these are the, the six uh, X-like languages, and um, aside uh, of these six, uh, there has been development for for more languages, of course, uh, to, to be included in this uh, system, like uh, Hindi, uh, via associated partner, and even we in Zagreb are building the similar thing for Croatian. So as soon as the project ends, we'll probably have uh, the whole set of tools also available for Croatian. So what I would like to uh, show you today is actually what uh, has been built in the first year of the project, so that means in the last year, so it's a multilingual pipeline, so there are six pipelines for six languages that are doing all the same, same uh, uh, type of processing, so you can simply output, input the, the text, uh, the free text, and then uh, the pipelines will do uh, sentence splitting, tokenization, lemmatization part of speech tagging, uh, name entity recognition and classification, parsing and semantic role detection. So if you look at the structure, it looks like that. So you have uh, this, all, all the modules available for each language, so English, Spanish, German, Catalan, and so on. So you input the XML, you get the linguist analysis, linguistic analysis that does all that, and you get an output XML which is enriched actually by information about lemmas, entities, syntactic triples, and predicate argument roles. So if you look at the syntactic triples, oh, it's not, it's too, too small, okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> so if you look at the syntactic patterns matching mechanism, then you can see a subject that is doing something. So here are, here are some actions. Uh, actions are on the, on the links. And then you have uh, objects. So this subject is doing this to that. So Rajoy is adding a problem. What you would, of course, expect from a Spanish prime minister, that he is just adding the problems, not solving them. Okay. Or uh, you can have... Uh, <coughs> uh, I can't really read that. Okay, so he can dismiss a count book. Okay, so he's, he's dismissing a count book. Okay. So this is the analysis on the level of syntax. Okay. But the next step, of course, is semantic roles, and this is where a network becomes much, com much more complicated. So this is the, the result of, what was it, 100, 100 documents, 100, 100 yeah, hun it was 100 uh, documents. So you get this type, and you, of course you have the same agent all the time here, so that's the prime minister, Spanish prime minister, doing all that. Okay. So there is, a, there is a way how you can really map what a certain agent, what kind of actions he is doing to, to whom. Okay. All right, so, uh, so this type of uh, analysis is now available. And uh, later, when, when after, or during the questions or after the questions, I can try to demonstrate. I mean, this, this runs online, so we can, we can demonstrate that if you want. So now I would like to conclude my talk with uh, <coughs> the following thing. So what actually I have presented is uh, an exercise how a research community that I would say is mature enough can boost its visibility and its impact by coordinated pan-European effort. So this is something what I would, I would say practically any research community can do. Um, and then we wanted to also involve all the relevant stakeholders. When I say stakeholders, it's not just researchers, it's also users, it's also uh, commercial users, and it's also, I would say, um, policy makers. And this is where you want to, of course, get support. And you, you won't get it without the policy makers, okay? And then, of course, we managed to produce a common data sharing platform with more than 2,000 data units, whatever you want to call them. In our, in our case, it's language resources and tools, which are at your disposal. And, of course, I, I demonstrated some of the language technology examples in, uh, in a project that, uh, that is still running. And that's about all I had to say. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm open for questions, of course. Thank you.
Asher, you said it, it's like providing a lot of software tools. How compatible are they between each other? Like if you take, for example, like English parser or in German parser, do they expect data input in, dif dif in the same format or completely different? Well, <coughs> that of course depends, depends on the system, but uh, each and every piece of software is documented. So um, you have uh, clearly descri described the input format and output format. So there's no guarantee that English parser and German parser will work on the same format of data. So there's no standards? No, not in this yeah. respect. We were not aiming at, at, uh, at making them all uh, compatible in this respect. Okay? But at least to achieve uh, the the same level of documentation was, uh, uh, I would say, challenge on its own. And I think we, we managed with that. Because you don't get only description, you also get references to the papers, to works. So you can even uh, read about it in, in more into details. Okay. Maybe one short question. A question: uh, Can these tools be used uh, only through the web interface, or no, 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 web no, no? You can. They can. They, there are different. So they could be standalone tools. So you uh -huh. download them, you you install them on your computer, and then you run them, or they could be web services. That that is uh, precisely described in in this uh, in this. So, <coughs> so if you want, I can I can show you them. Let me check. So if I go to uh, one of the managing notes and I ask for Slovenian instead. Well there's a funny thing all some sometimes you call your language Slovene, sometimes it's Slovenian. And uh, I think in metadata it's always Slovenian. Although <coughs> in the names you will find sometimes for instance like here. So you'll find Croatian and Slovene. But here see this is the directly uh, taken from metadata, so it's, it's Slovenian. Okay, so <coughs> so you, for instance, this is a, this is a, a model which you can uh, freely download and then include in uh, in the Stanford Name Entity Recognition System. Okay, and then you you can read all the all what you need about. Well, let me see why why I can't. Yeah, because it's too too small. Yeah. Okay. So these are all the information you can get. And uh, on this side you have all the resource creators and so on. And so you have access to also. You even have a link to the tool that will use these models. Okay. So uh, all the relevant information are provide, provided for for you to to download it and use it as easy as possible. Or, or something else, we can look at the meta shared description of. Uh, or you can filter by names of languages. Okay, so first we issued Slovenian, and then you have uh, sub filters. Okay, or you can, you can filter by corpus type. So you can see here you have nine corpora, seven lexical conceptual resources, and, and one language description. Or media type, text audio, and then uh, availability. So some of them have unrestricted use, some are restricted use. Restricted use means that probably it's only for non-commercial purposes, for research purposes, and so on and so on. Okay. And you have different licensing mechanisms. So these are all facets. So if I if I say okay, uh, CC BY, that means I will narrow down my list to only four languages, four resources. So that these are Slovenian resources that are covered by this license. Okay. So each of the each of these filters can be used freely as much as you want. So how is it maintenance after the end of the project? Where is it running? Well, uh, <coughs> at this moment, uh, uh, the one of the managing nodes is ELRA, which is a European Language Resources Agency and uh, distribution agency, ELDA. So they, they took over the MetaShare, part of MetaShare, at least one of the managing nodes. Most of the partners from this project, from a network of excellence, um, 
send a letter of, uh, of memorandum of, un of understanding or letter of intent that they will maintain the whole system running for at least two more years without asking for any uh, additional funding. And this is uh, roughly estimated that after two years some other source of funding will be found. Okay. In some, in some cases, for instance, in, in, in case of Zagreb, we were very lucky because we opened a virtual server in our university computing center that is taking care about all the technical part, you know, backup and, also, and all the things. And this virtual server is up 24-7 and uh, we can expand it as much as we want because we are a part of university and this center is being financed di directly by the, the, by the... We have only resources for creation, but then the metadata propagated up to the, up to the managing nodes and the seven managing nodes have the copy of everything. Okay. That's the federation uh, approach. Um, so do, maybe that's more a question for Dunia actually, but do we have a, a, a virtual server or whatever, Metashare for Slovenia as well, for Slovenia? Um, as, far as, I, as far as I know, no, because all the Slovenian resources are, are uh, stored on some other repository. So it really doesn't matter where it is, actually. We were simply... Uh, we put up the, our virtual server practically in the last two weeks of a project because our uh, coordinator of CESAR project asked us to do that. We could, we could easily live without it, so we could easily say, okay, our resources are in Warsaw server. Uh -huh, because I thought the main, the managing nodes only have metadata, so that's not true, they also have the actual no, no, resources. No. No, no, managing nodes are managing metadata, that's true. But then some of them also function as uh, repositories, okay? For instance, Warsaw node is both, which was the, 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 the main and the only, the main and the only node for Caesar up to the end of the project. And then at the end of the project, we were asked to spread this information to lower nodes, so just storing, storing, uh, as a repository. But I see that a bit problematic now because if the project ends, right, then Ended. what's the interest of Warsaw of accepting, say, new language resources? They get the money for it? Yeah, that's true. But yeah. it costs them something yeah. to upload, to maintain, and so on. Yeah, that's true. It would be uh, more <coughs> appropriate or naturally expected to, <coughs> to keep your own node, national node, and to fill it up with your on resources. Yeah, but then the problem is what about the international resources when you have you know, like seven languages, a resource that covers seven languages, who is taking care about that? All seven or just one of them or two? Which combination? So that's not, probably the resource creator is doing that. Okay, that's, that's what you would do. Yes? Uh, how would you judge the completeness of this MetaShare repository in the sense that there are many language resources out there. So if I'm looking for something and find it on MetaShare, then all is well. But if I don't find it, how good is the chance that it's out there but simply not on MetaShare? Well, there is a chance always. I, I, it would be foolish to say that there's no chance to do that. But um, I would say that language technology community made every effort possible to include as much as, as uh, resources as possible into MetaShare. I mean, there's no guarantee that there is a resource outside of it, absolutely. But I would say it's the first place where you would go. And then if it's not there, then you might expect some more effort you would need to, to f dig it out, if, if possible at all. Are they, sorry? Um, <clears throat> I think there has been some ranking mechanism about really what exactly uh, popularity, but I'm, I've never tried to check that out because I'm, I'm simply not running this type of ranking usually. 
I'm, 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 uh, I think there has been, look, you have similar, you have something like that. So if I, for instance, select um, this resource, then you get, I think, at the end or somewhere, I've seen it somewhere, just a second, I'm not sure. I've seen it somewhere on the bottom, that people interested in this resource were also interested in some, some other resource. And then you get a list of resources that someone else was also interested in. So there is this type of uh, ranking, okay. some kind of recommendation, okay? But not in, not in this one. I, I don't know why not in this one. Maybe... So, number of views, number of downloads, okay, language name. So you have, you have this type of ranking, okay? And these are number of views, of course, you see. I, this is number of downloads. And this moment, well, this is uh, expected since uh, the whole thing was launched in January. And these are quite specific, I would say, uh, type of resources. So I will stick only to language technology prototypes. Uh -huh. So you have, uh, <coughs> of course, we have example sentences which you don't have to type in, but you would type in a sentence here. So if I say so, we have a language identification here. You can either say in advance which language it is, or you leave it to the system to recognize. And then you get the analysis. <coughs> so the sentence is being syntactically analyzed. And then you have annotations. That means you link, you link the name entity to ontological space. Okay, so you have links of name Bruce Springsteen to uh, Wikipedia unique identifiers in English, German, Spanish, Chinese, and Catalan Wikipedias, you see. So this works for these five languages. For some strange reason, Slovenian was working earlier, but I, I think it's, it's at this moment it might be down. So it should be Slovenian here as well, okay? And then you have another... Uh, <coughs> You have an, uh, oh, you see a Slovene here. We don't have Bruce Oh, you don't have Bruce, yeah, you, ha you don't have, how come you don't have Bruce Springsteen in Slovenian Wikipedia? He's not popular in Slovenia? Come on. <clears throat> okay, but United States, of, of course, you have. Okay, fine, so, so you have it, this six. Okay, and uh, as a notion of multi-instrumentalist only in English, German, and Spanish, and singer-songwriter only in this, to, well, in all six of them, okay? So this is, uh, this is as you see, not just uh, syntactic analysis, it's also uh, analysis of um, name entities and then linking these name entities to an ontological space. And this is how much we needed for that, okay? 62 milliseconds, so good. Is this linking always then to Wikipedia or also some other resources? This prototype is working with Wikipedia, but we are also now experimenting with Divipedia and some other ontological, uh, practically all the linked, linked open data. Uh, so we'll, we'll check which one of, the, of these will be the most appropriate. Yeah, this one is working now. And you see the types here, of course, you see. <coughs> The American is type other, Bruce Springsteen is type person. This is, uh, let me check what kind of information we have here. So this is type from annotations. So this, these are uh, other type of annotation, not the name entities, okay. Because we are now tracking the concepts, see. so. Singer-songwriter was tracked as a concept. Not, not literally, but tracked as a concept. Anything else? Okay. Uh, I'm the speaker again. Thank you very much.